the kids be dismissed. It's a sad moment when the kids leave. Now for some of us, you're thinking, yeah, the kids are going to go. We'll let the kids be dismissed. Looking forward to what God's going to do this week. Um, you know, God desires revival in us because He wants to have a fellowship with us. God wants to be close. You know, God always wants, we said this in Sunday school, but God always wants to be close to us. He doesn't just want us to be close during times of revival services like this. However, it's so easy to get away from Him and get hard and sort of callous towards God so that the, the, the closeness isn't there. And what we need is God to renew or revive us. And that's the idea. Again, preacher said, uh, we scheduled a revival meeting, but we can't schedule a revival because it's a hundred percent related to your heart. It's completely related to whether or not you'll let God do a work in you. And so we have to soften ourselves. Uh, now, we're going to be in the book of Ezra, so if you'll find that and stand with me, and we'll read our text in Ezra chapter 3. We did start in Ezra chapter 1 in Sunday school, and the reason why is because we're going to be going through the book of Ezra for all of our messages during revival. Now, why would we do that? Because Ezra was written to the nation of Israel as a way of preparing them to have a revival of their worship in the rebuilding of the temple. They'd been away from God. They had not been able to worship in the temple because they were in exile. They had created synagogues, but all that was for them was a form of worship. And what they needed was a revival. And so Ezra wrote to his people to prepare them for the revival of worship and the building of the temple. Because a form of worship will never be good enough. And that's how it is for you and me. We might have a form of worship, but in your heart, you know, it's just not really, the fire isn't really there. Something isn't quite right. You can have the outward, but what we want is that fire to burn within. And God will kindle that in you. We just need to let Him do it. Now look at chapter 3, and we'll read, we'll just read verse number 1 and 2. And then we'll get into this. The Bible says, And when the seventh month was come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. By the way, I love that phrase. The people gathered themselves together as one man. So the idea is unity. They all wanted revival. They all wanted the temple to be rebuilt. And they were excited about it. And there was unity. And there was a closeness. Um, And we see that right there in verse 1. Now look at verse 2. Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Father, I pray your blessings, please, upon the message as we go through chapter 3 here and we see, Lord, the, the building blocks of revival. I pray that you'd help us to see in our soul, in our heart, what you'd have us to see so that we might uh, learn and to be close to you and to have faith and to see what you'd have us to do. Lord, I pray that you'd empty me of self, fill me with your spirit. I pray for confidence in you. And then I pray that you would do a great work in our presence. I pray for courage in those that you guide them in your path. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. I'm just going to sort of push this to the side. Hey, there we go. Okay. How many of you, us, I'm going to put myself in this category, okay? You walked into a room to get something or do something, and as soon as you got in there, you forgot why you walked into that room. Raise your hand. Okay, you can put your hand down. I promise you not enough hands went up right there, okay? I think we've all, you know, do that. I asked that question at our church, and hands went up just like then all over the auditorium, but one of our men over here, he, said, he lifted his voice with confidence and said, every day. That was his response. I love it. Uh, one of the boys, the boys and I, I have four boys, uh, 16, 14, 12, and 10. 
Don't ask me what their actual birthdays are, because you know that that I might be embarrassed on that one. But uh, I was having a conversation with the boys the other day, and it was a serious talk. And at the end of that conversation, I mean, we we're just talking about this, and I said, guys, I want you to forget about this. I want you to forget about it. And in all seriousness, one of my boys looked at me and said, forget about what? <laughs> Perfect. Just stay right there. <laughs> it wasn't being sarcastic. Like he really lost it somewhere in there. And he had no idea what I was referencing for him to forget. You know, you know there are some things that we forget, but there are some things we cannot afford to forget. We cannot afford to forget the importance of the gospel and how God works in a soul. The importance of getting the message to the lost. Really, that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's why we're here. You say, well, wait a second, preacher. I mean, I thought we're here to bring glory to God. And that is true, to bring glory to God. And and I, I suppose as an ultimate purpose, that would be what God has called us to do, is to bring glory to Him. But think about this. Our mission, our commission, is to get the gospel to the world. Now, you needed to be saved, and when you came to church or wherever context you heard the gospel for the first time, and it struck your heart, what happened in that moment is God is working through the gospel to touch your heart. He speaks to you through His Word. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And then he said, why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. So if you're saved or if you're going to be saved, then you must be exposed to the gospel. Now, I'm glad that you're here and we're even right at this moment talking about the gospel. But listen to this. The Bible says, faith unto salvation cometh by hearing. This is a familiar verse in Romans chapter 10. Hearing implies some very important things. Number one, it implies that you showed up. You're not going to hear the gospel very well if, you, if you're not here. And so people who are going to be saved, they need to be here. Or, or, or if we desire that people are going to hear the gospel so that they might be saved, then we need to pray for them that they'll, they'll be in a place where they'll hear the gospel just being here. Now, that, that actually should do something in us to want to get the lost here. You know, it doesn't happen. People don't hear about Jesus because they watched our life. Now, listen, we can have a testimony that helps somebody's heart to be open to receive the gospel. But if they're going to be saved, faith cometh by hearing. They have to hear the gospel. And so there should be something in us that says, you know what? I want to get the, I want to get an invitation to somebody because you might be nervous. Like if you're put in a position where you need to actually talk to somebody about Jesus or tell them how they can be saved, you're thinking, hmm. I don't know if I'm prepared for that. But you know, if you just gave an invitation, if you gave a track, if you, if you gave a good word to somebody, because often a good word will go so much further than we even realize, because in this world, there's not a lot of encouraging things happening, but God can use us to be an encourager. So we invite somebody to come and praise God they're here. But did you know there's something else that's implied in the meaning of hearing? Faith cometh by hearing. Not just that you're here, but that you're making effort. That you're trying to listen. I mean, I talked about it in Sunday school where sometimes uh, there's a congregation and, and people are here, but they're not there. Or they're there, but they're not here. We talked about that. I'm not sure which way it goes, but there's like a blank check, you know, like well, they're here, but they're not, you know. So listen, and that happens a lot with teenagers. I don't know why that is. That's the like, this is a common catchphrase for teens. How are you doing? Tired. <laughs> Just one word. Can't even get the whole thing out. Just tire. No D on the end. Tired. So, okay. So you're here. Praise God. But if you're not listening, gospel isn't going to strike to the heart. So you got to make effort. So we're here. We're listening. What's the third thing? Well, that kind of falls on the preacher because it needs to make sense. When we come to church and we hear the message. Now, don't answer this like because it'll hurt your pastor's feelings. Okay. But how many times, like literally, don't it? Anyway, so, so how many times we come to church and the message is delivered and you're like, I did not understand anything that was just now said. You know, I did not get that. So, so there's a little bit of responsibility on the man who delivers the message. Okay, but all three things need to happen. You need to be in a place where you're going to hear the gospel. You need to give effort to intellectually try to get it. 
Like, I'm going to make effort to try to listen. And then the preacher delivers a message that makes sense. And you get it. And it and it explains the scripture. All three of those things wrapped up into one thing. Here's what happens. God says that faith then will begin to stir and to work inside you. Faith cometh by hearing. So God will begin to work in your soul and speak to you in the area of your need of him. So if you need to be saved, he'll begin to speak to your heart. Why? Because you came, you listened, and it made sense. So he's speaking to you, and what does he say? He says, you need this. The Spirit works in you. He says, you need to be saved. If you're, if you're lost, he'll tell you. He'll speak to you. Now, he'll tell you that it's true, because sometimes we come to church and we wonder, lost often do this. Uh, people who aren't saved, when I say lost, that's what I mean. People who don't know Christ, they, you're just not sure of your eternal destiny. I mean, you want to know uh, about God. You want to know about heaven. You want to know what happens after we die. And perhaps you have those questions. And you hear a message like this, and you start to wonder, mm, it makes sense, but did, is this really true? Like, is this really, because there's a lot of religions. And so we wonder, is this really true? And so the, the pastor, if he's, if he has any fire in him at all, he preaches with passion. And so you can be convinced that the preacher believes it. But there are scripture devoted to the church, encouraging the church to help us understand that we can all of us work together to help convict the lost. How is that? So when the preacher says something that's true and he's passionate and, and you're, you're in, you know, you understand that it's true and God's used it in you, then you say this word. Amen. You say that. Do you know what the word amen does to those that are around us who are not sure if it's true? They know that the pastor believes it. But now there's at least three or four other people that they know they believe it too because they said amen. So here's what happens. There there is a conviction that starts to fall over the congregation because there is a unity, a oneness through the preaching of the gospel and God starts stirring in the hearts of the lost. If you're lost, I don't need to convince you of that. I used to tease our church and actually I still do sometimes. You know that, that, that feeling that you have inside that you need to respond and that something's working, or maybe your heart starts doing this. There's not electroids. Is that a word? Electroids? Anyway, there's not some kind of electrical system in the chairs. And then just at the right moment, when the, past, when the preaching's getting hot and, and heated, and we're right in the midst of it, that, there's a button back here, and I push it. And I push the button, and then you feel, oh, do you, did you feel that? Oh, I felt it. That's not how the gospel works. If you're feeling something in your soul and, and you're being moved from within, that's the Holy Ghost. Amen. He is speaking to you. I can't do that. But He will. You know how He does it? He uses the Word of God. It's His Word to you. I deliver the message. He speaks to your heart. And what does He say? You need this. Well, He says this is true. He confirms. He affirms the truth. So you hear the message and you hear about Jesus and you wonder, you came in wondering, is this true? And in your soul, you know it's true. Why? Not because I'm convincing you, but because God's convincing you. The Spirit is touching you. He's telling you it's true. But then the, the next thing that follows that always is not just the, that God says it's true, but He tells you you need it. It's called conviction. And so we sit in a church service like this. God begins to speak to our heart. And sometimes it starts going like this because you know you're lost. You know, if you were to die today, you, you don't have eternal hope. In fact, the more you hear about the gospel, the more you hear about relationship with Jesus, that Jesus called it being born again. It's a decision we made when God convicts our soul and we turn our hearts to him in salvation. It's not an outward exercise. He'll start convincing you that not only you uh, that salvation is real and Jesus has given us a, a way of being saved, but that you're not saved. And then the consequence of that is eternal separation from God. By the way, you might think, well, that's a nice way to, to say it because hell is a kind of a thing we don't like talking about. It's a reality. People go there. But the reality of it is, is this. And what makes it hell is God isn't there. And you'll be separated from God for all of eternity. And that reality becomes real in us when He convinces us that our sins have separated us from Him and we know we need to be saved. You know, the devil will, will never stop fighting to stop the gospel. The, ne- the devil will never stop fighting to hinder the ministry. The devil will never stop bringing distractions into your life to keep you from hearing the message that will bring that eternal hope. If you're lost, he'll want to keep you away from it. If you're lost, he'll, he'll bring things to your mind to distract you. If you're saved, he'll try to keep you from growing and being a vessel used of God to get the gospel to the world. 
What we need is, what we need is a revival in the sense that we need God to work in us again. What we need is a renewal, a revival where it, where God speaks to our heart and it's so clear we know that it's Him and we know exactly what He wants us to do and now you have a choice on the table and it has nothing to do with the preacher. It has nothing to do with your circumstances. It has everything to do with what He is speaking to you about. That's what we need. Revival stirred us, stirs us. We talked about that in Sunday school. Um, in chapter one, God stirred to bring revival. The nation of Israel had lost their song. They are in exile. They had synagogues, forms of worship, but they didn't have the real thing. And that happens in us. And what we need is God to stir us. And it might be that God's going to do that today. But you know, after God stirs and begins to work in us, it's time to get to work. For Israel, it was time for them to to get to work in the process of making plans to build the altar. And really, that's what it says in verse 2. Take a look at it again. It says, Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and his brethren, look what it says next, and builded the altar of the Lord God of Israel. So this is a preparative kind of altar uh, so that they might have the ability to worship God in the preparations of the actual building of the temple. So they're making plans. And look down to verse number 6. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord that using that altar they built in verse number two, but verse six, the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So the people were getting excited about the revival so that they built an altar so they could have a, 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 you know, a time of worship even before the temple was built. By the way, we, what we need is God to stir us we, we need to have a kind of excitement about the things of God. Now, I like to watch football. I like football. Don't ask me to play football because I probably never walk again after one time. So, um, but you go into the stadium and what you have is how many thousands of people that are pretty excited about their team. And this is almost cliche. We've heard things like this. But listen, we need to have a, a kind of excitement in us for the things of God. Listen, God wants to stir us. He wants to bring us a renewal of our closeness to Him. And there ought to be something in us that says, you know, I'm getting kind of excited about what God might do in me. I'm getting excited about the potential of what God might speak to me about. You know, I think sometimes when you go on, vac- when you go on vacation, it's how many of you you can't wait for vacation whenever it's like a month out you're like man i cannot wait for like vacation you know and so you're not on vacation yet but you're getting excited about it well maybe we've not been revived yet we need renewal but you know what we can do we can start getting excited about what god's going to do and we, you need that today because if you don't get that between now and the end of the service today, there's a good chance the devil's going to try to distract you from not even being here. And by the way, to get the word, you have to, like, you have to be here. You have to make an effort and then make an effort to listen and let God do the rest, right? So, so we need to get excited ab- about what God is going to do because he wants to do something tremendous. Okay. So, Israel's getting excited. Now look at verse 7. They gave money also unto the masons and to the carpenters. Now, don't forget where the money came from. Man, I wish it always worked like this. It came from the government. Okay? You're like, wait a second. Is that real? Look at, keep your finger in chapter 3, but go to chapter 1, verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus... Okay, let me start over. That was a lot of pages still rustling right there. Verse 1, chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of who? Cyrus. That would be the pagan king of, of Persia. And he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdom. And here's, here was the idea. Um, he's, going to, he's going to fund the rebuilding of the temple for Israel. So you can go back to chapter 3. 
So in verse number seven, they gave money. The one, the one that funded this, the money came from Cyrus, the king. And so they gave the money to the professionals who are going to do the work. Look at, uh, let's read the rest of that verse. The meat and drink oil unto them of Zidon and of them of Tyre, and or rather to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea of Joppa according to the grant. That's the money that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. And so in the preparations, the contracts are made with these laborers out of Lebanon who were well known not only for their cedar forests, but also for their fine woodworkers. So what they were doing is they were hiring the skilled laborers and the supplies appropriate for the work of the building of the temple. But it wasn't just the hired of the skilled labor that was important. It was uh, the, the hire, or rather the recruiting of the grunt labor. You know, the guys that have shirts that say, I might not be too smart, but I can lift heavy things. You know, I want to get that for my boys, you know. Um, we need those guys. We need the heavy lifters, the guys that that just go and pick up, you know, the 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 big blocks and carry it over there. Well, verse eight. Look what it says. Now, in the year of their coming into the house of God at Jerusalem, in this in the second month, began Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Joshua the son of Josedek and the remnant of their brethren and the priests of the Levites and all they that were come out of the captivity into Jerusalem and, note, appointed to the Levites from 20 years old and upward. So here's here's those guys that we needed. What are they going to do? The last phrase of verse 8, set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Verse 9, then stood Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, and the sons of Judah together to set forward the workmen, in the house of God, in the, uh, and so and so, what we have is these laborers who were going to be used to, you know, be a part of the building of the temple. Listen, the point is this: in this section, and it's so obvious because it's implied that the people of Israel they were getting excited about the building of the temple. They had the the altar, and they were getting excited about what God was doing in the building of the temple, and these these volunteers were easy to find because they were getting excited. You know, it's easy for us to find volunteers to be involved whenever there's an excitement, you know, an excitement. By the way, one thing that often happens is this excitement kind of dies down, and then the volunteers sort of wither away too. But what we need is is uh, God to stir in us, to work in us, to to bring us that kind of passion so that he might lead us. So, ooh, ooh, this is, I'm getting excited, I don't know. So, so, so that we know what God wants us to do, so then our commitment is what causes us to stay. So we don't fizzle and, and go away. We know what God wants us to do. Our hearts are open because we're getting excited about what God's doing. We Through that understanding and conviction, we can make a commitment to Him that's not based on our feelings at all. Although we get excited, and there ought to be an excitement, our decisions are based on our our conviction of what we know God wants us to do. So why are you you in Glendale, Arizona? I mean, I'm from Oklahoma City. I lived in Missouri for eight years, and then I was in Nebraska for ten years. Like, that's my sliver of the Midwest. I mean, a little south, a little bit north, a little bit more north, but all in the Midwest, all my life. And God calls me to Glendale, Arizona, and I'm, and, and I'm there. I've been there for seven months. About a month ago, I'm walking on this trail, and I'm talking with God and having a conversation with Him, and I'm asking Him, why am I here? What, why? I feel like, like a, round, a round peg in a square hole or a square peg in a round hole. I'm, I just feel like it don't fit. And in the process of this conversation with the Lord, it was as though I could hear him tell me with an audible voice. It wasn't audible, but it was that clear to me that God said, you're there because I told you to be there. That's a pretty good answer. You know, it's kind of hard to argue with that one. So why do we stay? Because we're right where God wants us to be. We don't stay because we feel like it. Perhaps there's an, a, an energy and excitement that we need God to stir in us like the laborers who are going to build the temple, and we need that. 
But what we need is beyond that in the sense that we need to hear from God in a clear way so we can make a commitment. And then our commitment is not based on what we feel. Well, it feels exciting. Well, great. But what does God want you to do? Because that's what's going to keep you in it when it's not exciting anymore. Israel were going to build a temple and there was an excitement there. Once the foundation was laid, I want you to see the response. This is so key. And we're starting to funnel into what God has for us here, okay? Look at verse 12. But many of the priests and the Levites and the chiefs of the fathers who were the ancient men, who were ancient men, the older, that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept. However, there were those that shouted with joy. So there were two responses. The point is this. The foundation was built of the temple and there were the ancient people. What, what is that? The older folks who, who remembered what it used to be like. Remember the old temple before it was destroyed and we went into captivity? They saw the old temple. They remember, remembered the splendor of it. And now they saw just the foundation of the new temple. And the Bible says they wept, but this isn't the kind of weeping for joy. This is a contrast with the joy that the others had. The weeping was a weeping of sadness. Now, why would they be sad after, after being so excited about the revival that's on its way? Because they saw the foundation. The temple wasn't even built yet, but they saw the foundation. You know what the foundation told them? This temple isn't going to be nearly as grand and beautiful as the old one was. And it brought sadness to them. However, there were those that weren't as concerned about the old temple. There were those that were excited about this temple and what's going to be built here. And the Bible says that those that were excited about what's happening on this foundation, the Bible says they were joyful about it. They were excited about it. Now, what is Ezra saying here? Well, we're talking about revival. We're talking about a renewal and revival that God wants to do in you and me. And what Israel struggled with here is often what you and I can struggle with. Well, what is it? It is this. God desires to build in your life, watch this, a foundation that revival can be built on. But we won't, we won't let it happen because we can't get past the past. We remember the past. We remember what it used to be. And we can't get that off of our mind enough to let God do what He wants to do in us today. We can't have joy because there's too much sadness about the past. So what do we need? Here's what we need. We need God to revive us. We need revival. You say, well, preacher, I don't know if I need revival. You might be one of the ones who needs it the most, perhaps. But for some of us, it might be that to have revival, you're going to have to get past some things from your past. There was a man in our church that began to visit, and the more we visited uh, an older gentleman, the more conversations we had. Uh, and I, I don't investigate to pry. I investigate because I care about people, and I'm just genuinely interested in their life and in their past and, and where they came from. And so we're just in conversation, and I found out that he was in Vietnam as an infantryman. And through that, you know, we didn't talk a lot about his experiences in Vietnam, but we developed, a, a, you know, a kind of friendship. And there was a, a, a reservation, so I try to let God work in somebody rather than me push somebody. And, and he, can, he and his wife continue to come to church, and I can sense that he was softening, and he and I were becoming friends. And so I asked him this. I said, his name's Bill. I said, Bill, would it be okay if we did a Bible study? He was reluctant for a couple of months about that, and I didn't pressure him all the time. Uh, maybe once a month I would ask him, and I'd say, Bill, would you be interested in a Bible study, just in conversation? And finally he said, you know, I, I'd be glad. I think I would do that. And he finally came into the office that week, because that's what I do. I'm like, would you be interested in a Bible study? Yeah, I think so. How about Tuesday at 3? <laughs> I'm ready, man. <laughs> so Tuesday at 3, Bill comes into the office, 
And we sat down, and I opened my Bible, and before I even say a word, here's what Bill said. He said, God can't save me. Okay. I said, why do you say that? He says, you don't know what I've done. Referencing his experiences in Vietnam. I said, well, I don't really want to know what you've done. Let's just see what God does. Let's just study together and see what, see what God does. So we began to study the scriptures in a slow, systematic conversation, not debate, but just learning, giving the gospel and learning, explaining and learning, questions, answering questions and learning. We did that for seven weeks. At the end of the seventh week Bible study, not every day, but once a week for seven weeks. And in that Bible study, Bill said, I don't want to meet anymore after this one. I mean, it, it hurt my heart. He still came to church on Sunday mornings with his wife. And I said, okay, we'll do this. And we did the Bible study. But at the end of the Bible study, I said, Bill, would you just meet for me with me one more time? Just one more next week? He said, oh, okay, I'll do that. So we, he came in the eighth week, and we did that Bible study. And I didn't pressure him. We just did the study. And he, there was no response, kind of stoic in, in the study. And then he went home. And he came to church that Sunday, and whenever he walked in, as soon as he came in on Sunday morning, he said this to me. He said, Pastor, I'm going to get saved today. That's what I said. I said, Amen. I said, Okay, so after I do the message, the invitation's going to happen. We do invitation where everybody stands, and you can come to the front. We call it the altar. It's steps, but the altar because... It's a place that you, a specific place you can come and meet with God. That's why we call it the altar. I said, I'll meet you at the altar. And as soon as you come up here, I'll know why you're coming and I'll be there to meet you. Did the message. Everybody stands. Invitation. Bill never moved. Never came to the altar. My heart was, my heart was saddened. After the dismissal, I caught Bill in the foyer. I said, Bill, you didn't come to the altar. He said, no, nah, I know. I just, I don't know. I gave him a scripture to meditate on. And he went home. And I went home and I prayed for him. And I didn't talk to him for that week. He came back to church on the next Sunday. And it was the first day of our revival. Bill didn't say, I'm going to get saved today. You know, like he did last week. He didn't say that. He just came in. In fact, he didn't even shake my hand. It kind of hurt my feelings. Went right to his seat. Sat down. He didn't act angry. Just, you know, let's just see what happens today. The preacher preached the message. The invitation began. And I'm not thinking a lot about Bill. I'm not thinking a lot about specific things, but revival and what God, I desire to see God do. He said, every head, everyone stand, every head bowed, every eyes closed, nobody's looking around. And then I heard, oh, it was loud. Our auditorium was smaller than this. And it echoed. Everybody started looking around. What is that? And it was Bill. He was moaning and crying out as he was making his way to the altar. I knew why he was coming. I met him at the altar and he was weeping. I said, Bill, are you ready to receive Christ? He said, I'm ready. I said, call out to him. But he called out to Christ right there at the altar. You could hear a pin drop in the auditorium. Everybody in the auditorium heard Bill get saved that morning. Every word that he said. I mean, he cried out to Christ at the altar. And then as he made his way back to his seat, he wept. He wept. It was the beginning of our revival. Four people got saved in that revival. And it was because Bill decided he wasn't going to let his past define his eternity. Listen, God wants to bring revival to you. He wants to bring salvation to the lost. 
he, watch this, he will not do any more than convince you that you need to be saved. He'll prick your heart. He'll speak to you. He'll tell you you haven't been saved and that you need this. Now, once you've been equipped with the conviction of the Holy Ghost, now it's up to you. You have to, like Bill, let your heart be broken. Not that you need to moan in a loud way, but you need to let your heart be broken. And you need to get to the place where you're willing to turn your heart to Him in salvation before it's too late. Revival in those that need to be saved begins when you let when you let God break your heart. And you don't allow your past to define your eternity. For those of us, perhaps, that need to just get some things right with God, and you're nervous about God's future for you because of what you've done in the past, here's what God wants to do. He wants to, through the blood of Christ, blot out your past. He wants to forgive you. By the way, forgive you of your sins. That gave me a chill a little bit. So the Bible says He wants to bury your sins at the depths of the sea. He wants to take your sin and cast them as far as the east is from the west. Now, I'm not talking about how men do it. I'm talking about how God does it. God wants to bring a revival to you through forgiveness so that you'll be willing to come to Him and ask Him to forgive you no matter your past so that you'll let your heart be broken. You'll meet God at the altar at a place where you can fellowship with Him and start the process by building the foundation. And when you see what God has for the future, you can have joy in that no matter what the past has been, as good or bad. You say, I have, a, I have a terrible past. God can give you an amazing future. So man, I had a, I had a, such a great past. I have su- has such great memories of how it used to be. It'll never be as good as it used to be. Listen, God has a future for you that's filled with joy, that's unspeakable and full of glory. You, there's, there's no describing. It's like peace that passes understanding. You can't describe it. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, hey, um, can you explain to me what peace is like? And then I just sort of tried to explain it. It's pretty difficult to explain peace of God. You just have it or you don't have it. God wants you to have peace that passes understanding, meaning you can't even explain it. That's the future He wants you to have. Don't let the past define what God wants to do in you today. What do we need to do? I want revival, preacher. I want it. I need it. I admit it. I confess it. I've been hard. I've built synagogues. I'm going through the motions. It's not really there. I need it. What do I need to do? Well, it might be that you need to get past the past. If you're willing to do that, mm, look at that foundation. God can do something great. And we're going to watch Him do it, I believe, this week. Father, I thank You for this great opportunity that we've had to be in Your house, to receive Your Word, to be touched by Your Spirit. And it might be, it might be that this morning there are some that are here who would acknowledge their need of salvation. Now, Obviously, there is nobody in this room who can definitively say who is or who is not saved. Only you know that. But at the same time, because you know who is or is not saved, you also work in their hearts through the gospel that we just declared. And you convict them. You convince them of their need. You speak to them. And it might be that there's somebody who's been touched Maybe they struggle to acknowledge it, but you've touched them and you've, to- you've spoken to them and you've convicted them of their need of salvation and perhaps they fought it. Perhaps they want to fight that touch from you, but I pray that you would in them even that much more convince them and give courage to them to acknowledge it. And if somebody knows they need to be saved and is ready to turn their heart to you in salvation before it's too late, even this morning, would you give them courage to come? and get it settled before it's too late. Perhaps there's somebody here, Father, I pray that you've been working in their heart and they have had a past and they have had a struggle and they have had something that has hindered them, keeping them from looking in joy to the future. Would you, Lord, through your sweet spirit and the peace of God that passes understanding, help them to see the power of the blood in the forgiveness of our sins, that the future can be so bright and exciting that they would turn their hearts back to you and not let the past define their future. 
So I pray for courage in all as you've worked in hearts. As we desire to build the foundation of revival, we give it to you in Jesus' name. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. I'm just going to ask one question. I'm going to ask who doesn't know certainly if they're saved. And when I ask that, I ask that you would just lift your hand. Nobody's looking around and I'll pray for you. Now I want you to know I'm not going to call you out. I won't find you after church. You can find me or the pastor or anybody, but I won't come tracking you down. If I knew your name, I won't say it, even if I knew it. But I'll pray for you. You say, preacher, I know I'm lost. God has spoken to my heart. I don't know my eternal destiny. I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you pray for me? If you'll lift your hand, I'll pray. Just lift it up. I'll see it. I'll, I'll acknowledge that, and then you can put it down. I'm not sure I'm saved. Would you lift your hand? Thank you. You can put it down. I see your hand. Anybody else? There's one who had courage to lift their hand. Perhaps that helps you. You say, preacher, I should have raised my hand just now, but I didn't. Would you pray for me? I think I'm, I'm, I'm certain, actually, I need to be saved, or at least I would acknowledge I don't know if I'm saved. Is there anyone that like that? Anybody else? Thank you. You can put your hand down. Another lifted their hand. They don't know. Anybody else? I'll just pray for you. Nobody's looking. I'll pray for you. Anybody? Just lift your hand. As I promised, I'm going to pray, and then we'll have invitation. Father, I pray for these that lifted their hand and perhaps some who didn't and they should have. Would you give them courage to come and get it settled before it's too late? And for those of us who just need to turn our hearts to you in forgiveness, help us with that, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. The piano will play. If God's worked in your heart,